Hello, friends, and welcome to our study of the Gospel of John. We're so glad you've joined us here, the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We are in our second week, and this lesson is entitled Signs of Divinity. A, lo a strong emphasis on the divinity of Christ. We're going to be looking at uh, some stories in the Gospel of John, various stories in the Gospel of John that really emphasize His divinity. We want to remind you, if you'd like to get our Sabbath School notes, you can do that by going to 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com and clicking on the little tab at the top it will automatically give you a form where you can fill out your uh, email information and we will send you those uh, Sabbath School notes. If you've already done that, you don't need to do it again. You're in perpetually, so to speak. But if you haven't done that, 3 abnsabbathschoolpanelcom click on the little tab, fill out the form, and you will get all of our personal Sabbath School notes. Now, before we get started on our lesson this week, I want to introduce you to your family and our Sabbath School panel today. To my immediate left is my dear sister in Christ, Shelley Quinn. It's so wonderful to be here. And I have Monday's lesson. and surely he is the prophet. We'll be looking at what Jesus said about himself. Amen, amen. And to your left is Professor Daniel Perrin. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. And I'm on Tuesday's lesson, which is the healing of the blind man, part one. The healing of the blind man, part one, amen. And to your left is Pastor Johnny Denzi. It's a blessing to be here. And I have the healing of the blind man, part one. The Healing of the Blind Man, <laughs> Part 2. And to your left, my sister in Christ, Jill Morricone. Thank you, Pastor James. On Thursday, we look at the resurrection of Lazarus. The resurrection of Lazarus. So we've got a packed week studying the signs of Christ's divinity. And before we do that, of course, we want to pause and just ask the Holy Spirit to be with us as we study. I'd like to ask Pastor John Dinsey, would you like to pray for us? Sure. Thank Let's you. go to the Lord in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we are able to study this wonderful book mm -hmm. that we read in the very end. There's so many things Jesus did that they're not even able to be put into books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, and we ask for the blessing of your Holy Spirit that we may speak your words and not ours. We ask for your blessing upon all that will listen, and we ask for these blessings in the holy and blessed name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Signs of divinity. We're going to be looking uh, this week at a number of Bible verses, John chapter 1, or excuse me, John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. I'll be covering those Bible verses. And then we have Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, be touching on those. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, also touching on those, myself. And then John 6, 26 to 36, John 9, 1 through 41, and 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29, and then John chapter 11. So our memory text is found in John chapter 11, 25 and 26. It reads, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he, were, he may die, he shall live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Amen. I love these Bible verses and especially the words, do you believe this? Jesus Christ is asking that to each one of us. And we just had a memorial service for my father-in-law and part of the service uh, was an emphasis on John chapter 11. And I asked everyone that was there, all the family, do you believe this? Do you personally believe this? Because our father-in-law did believe that. And he's going to be in that first resurrection. And I was in urging the family, we all need to be there with him so that we can, or also so that we can see him again in that resurrection. You know, the Bible is clear that Jesus Christ is eternal, the eternal Son of God. This is what our lesson quarterly says in less, the lesson for Sabbath. He's one with the Father, he's underived, he's uncreated. Jesus is the one who created all that was made, John 1, 1 through 3. Thus, Jesus has always existed. There has never been a time when he didn't exist. Now, though Jesus came to this world and took upon himself our humanity, he has always kept his divinity. And at, a specific, at specific times, Jesus said and did things that revealed his divinity. We saw, or the people there saw, divinity flashing through humanity. This truth was important for John. It was something that he emphasized. This is why when recounting some of Jesus' miracles, John used them to point to Christ's divinity. Mm -hmm. He wasn't just about saying that Christ performed these miracles. John was about saying that Christ performed these miracles and therefore this is an evidence that he was indeed 
God. Jesus not only said things that revealed his divinity, but he backed them up with words and works that manifested his divinity. This week's lesson is going to look at three of, of Jesus' greatest signs of his divinity. And what is striking is that in every case, there were people who believed when they saw these signs, and then there were people who didn't believe. People believed and people didn't believe. Now, for some, it was a time of great rejoicing. Messiah had come, but for others, it was a time of turning away from Jesus, uh, a deepening of their blindness, uh, even leading them to plot the death of Christ. And so we want to be choosing to be among those who allowed the divinity of Christ, the revelation of that divinity through his miracles to be a time of rejoicing, a time when we would see and accept Christ as Messiah. Sunday's lesson begins with the story of the feeding of the 5,000. This is one of the signs of his divinity that we're going to be emphasizing this week. It's in John chapter 6. And in verses four and five, the apostle actually goes out of his way to state that the timing of the feeding of the 5,000 was near the Passover. Now the Passover is a commemoration of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt when the death, the angel of death passed over those who had put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and the lentils. In other words, those who were trusting in the blood of the lamb, which pointed to Jesus Christ as the ultimate sacrifice for sin. So the Passover lamb took the place of the death of the firstborn. This sacrifice symbolized the death of Jesus on our behalf. On the cross, the punishment that we deserve because of our sins fell on Jesus instead. We call that substitutionary atonement. Jesus died for us, but he also died as us, as our second Adam, as our Passover, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 tells us. He bore the guilt of transgression and the hiding of his father's face until his heart was broken and his life was crushed out. All the sacrifice was made that sinners might be redeemed. And that's from Ellen G. White, Great Controversy, page 540. So when we read John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, we're going to see here some parallels to Jesus and Moses. Moses was the one who initiated, of course, that Passover feast. He was the one that God used to deliver his people from the bondage of Egypt. And there were a lot of parallels with what Moses did in relationship to the Passover and what Jesus did when he came as the fulfillment of all of those types. And it reminds us of all of those uh, types that pointed to Jesus Christ. Let's just go through a few of these details. We're not going to read all the verses here. You can read those uh, yourself. I don't have the, uh, enough time to read them all, but John chapter 6 verses 1 through 14 will bring these parallels to us. Now, one of the parallels is the time of the Passover. In John chapter 6 verse 4, we already mentioned that. John emphasizes that when Jesus fed the 5,000, it was about the same time as the Passover. And this points to the great deliverance that was made for God's people out of Egypt. Egypt. Jesus has come now in the flesh to deliver his people out of the bondage of sin. Jesus goes up to a mountain in John 6 and verse 3. Moses went up to Mount Sinai. Yes. Jesus tests Philip. You know, do you have enough faith to believe that we can feed the, this great multitude? You know, uh, let's provide food for them. And of course, and then we find that in John chapter six, verses five and six. The Israelites were also tested in the wilderness time and time again to see if they would maintain their faith in God as their deliverer. And then there's the multiplication of the loaves in John chapter six and verse eleven. And this reminds us of the miracle of the manna, which pr was provided every single morning before the sun came up. Of course, if you waited till after the sun came up, that manna would disappear. But if you gathered it before the sun came up, you would have enough for the day, except on Friday. On Fridays, you would gather two omers. You would gather twice as much because the manna did not appear on the Sabbath day. Another miracle because the manna would rot if you try to keep it over any other day except for Friday, it would stay fresh for the Sabbath and you would have enough to get through the Sabbath so you didn't have to go out and gather manna on the Sabbath, reminding, of course, God's people to keep uh, the Sabbath. And then we see the uh, gathering of the leftover food in John chapter 6 and verse 12, and that harkens back to the Israelites um, gathering that manna and then on Friday, of course, having that extra. Uh, the 12 baskets of leftovers uh, that were picked up in John 6 verse 13, the same number of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so we have the people 
seeing in Jesus a lot of parallels to the story of Moses and, and the work of God through Moses in the Old Testament. All of this points to Jesus as, in a sense, the new Moses, the new deliverer. Thus, Quarterly goes on to say, John is showing Jesus not only doing signs and wonders, but doing signs and wonders that in their context mm -hmm. should have had special meaning for the Jewish people pointing them in essence to their own destiny, right? Showing them where they've come from and now where they're going. Making that connection between Moses, between the Old Testament and the present manifestation of the Messiah. The quarterly goes on to say that we can read in Isaiah 53 verses four through seven and 1 Peter chapter two verses 21, the great truths that teach us about Jesus being the Lamb of God. Now, how does his divinity tie into this truth? And why is this truth more important than we can ever know? Because in the context of Isaiah chapter 53, let's just read uh, just a few verses there, Isaiah 53 verses four through six, we find God dying for sinners. Mm -hmm. It says here, Isaiah 53, four, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And many times we read those verses as if it's talking about two different people, God the Father and God the Son. But Jesus says in John 10 verse 30, I am my Father are one, right? So when we look at it from that perspective, reread the verses, surely he, God the Father and God the Son has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. In other words, we see a separation taking place. The Jews thought God is smiting Jesus. That's the way we see it. That's not what's happening at all. He was wounded for our transgressions, meaning the Father and the Son, both wounded for our transgressions, both bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, God the Father and the Son, and with His stripes, Father and Son, all, uh, all we are healed. All we like sheep have turned astray, we've gone everyone to our own way, and the Lord has laid upon Himself the iniquity of us all. In other words, when you see the, the crucifixion of Christ, you're not just seeing the suffering of Christ, but you're also seeing the suffering of the Father. And of course, we see this in the story, for example, of Abraham in the Old Testament. The Father suffered with the Son. The Father was there at Calvary with the Son. This is not a sacrifice like the heathens of a third party, sacrifice to a deity who wants appeasement from a third party in order to save us. This is the sacrifice of God Himself in Jesus Christ. So it says here, continuing on, that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. That's Galatians chapter three and verse 13. Jesus Christ, divinity has suffered in our behalf that we might be redeemed from the curse of sin and have eternal life. Hey, amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor James, for that wonderful foundation. Uh, my name is Shelley Quinn. I have Monday's lesson. Surely he is the prophet. All right, so he multiplies the loaves. He feeds the 5,000. How did the people respond to his miracle? John 6, verse 14 says, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Therefore, verse 15, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now remember the Judeans, they believed that the Messiah was coming as a conquering king, the deliverer to set them free from Rome's oppression. It's interesting, our quarterly says, two of the most difficult things encountered in war are one, feeding the troops, and two, caring for the wounded and dead. Mm -hmm. And by his miracles, Jesus showed he could do both. Mm -hmm. But that's not why he had come. That wasn't the purpose of his miracle. Instead, the account of the feeding of the 5,000 provided the opportunity to illustrate that Jesus is the bread of life. Amen. The Amen. God himself came down from heaven, unquote. So go on in verse 
John 6 and verse 26. We'll begin there. Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Mm -hmm. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said, look how people always taking it literally. Oh, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. You can have that bread always. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. I am the bread of life. This is the first of seven I am statements that Jesus made about himself. I am is the name of God, the God who was, who is, and who is to come. Now, we find in Exodus chapter 3, we'll read it in just a second, Moses sees the burning bush. He's standing at the burning bush. The angel of the Lord is speaking to him. And Moses says, well, if you're sending me on your behalf, who am I supposed to say? What's your name? And he says, I am. And many Bible scholars, including a very popular Bible scholar, Matthew Henry, believe that the angel of the Lord was the pre-incarnate Christ. He never appears again once the second person of the Godhead becomes the person of Jesus Christ. But angel in the Greek and in the Hebrew means messenger. So the angel of the Lord was distinct from the Father and as I said, never appeared again after Christ's incarnation. So let's look at one of these times when he appeared, Exodus 3, 13 and 14. The angel is speaking to Moses. Moses asks his name. And then the Bible says, God, this angel of the Lord said, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me. So in the New Testament, Jesus, when he said, I am the bread of life, and we're going to look at his other I am statements, he is claiming to be the eternally pre-existent God. I love, and we don't have time to go into this whole story, but in John 8, 58, Jesus said to the Jews, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham, I am. Mm -hmm. So now let's look at how Jesus presents himself as the I am, the Yahweh, the covenant God of the Old Testament. In the, this first one, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Do you remember what Jesus told the devil in the wilderness when he was being tempted? He said, man shall not, when the devil said, turn these stones into bread. He said, no, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. And in John chapter one, which we've yet to review, but we will. In John one, Jesus is called the Word. He is the living Word. The second I am statement, John 8, 12. 
I'm the light of the world. He who follows after me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John chapter 1, once again, John says of Jesus, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The third I am statement, John 10, 9, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He is the gate, the only way into the sheepfold of God. John 10, 11, his fourth I am statement, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So Jesus leads his sheep. And if you know anything about animal husbandry, Sheep are led, cattle are driven. You don't drive sheep. Jesus leads his sheep. And in contrast to the hired hand, these would be the hirelings, would be the the religious leaders who carried only for their self-preservation. This Jesus, as our good shepherd, is ready to lay down his life to pay our sin penalty. The fifth statement, John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he died, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Christ has resurrection power. And only in Christ is there eternal life. John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Acts 4.12, it said, there is salvation in no other name. There's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. And then Romans 3.23 and 24 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There is no question that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ, that we are made righteous by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And then finally, Number seven of his I am statements, Jesus says, I am the vine. Mm -hmm. You know, the vine was a symbol of the church in the Old Testament. He's saying, I am the true vine. Mm -hmm. You are the branches, and we are branches that have been grafted in if we're a Gentile. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, Mm -hmm. you can do nothing nothing of eternal consequence. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. We're going to look at these a little deeper in another lesson. But just know, Jesus surely was the prophet who was to come. Amen, amen. So there you go, friends, some signs of divinity. I think we've laid a great foundation. Don't go away, we'll be right back. Hello, I'm Greg Morricone. I'm so glad you joined me for today's 3ABN Mission Moment. Larnetta sat in her apartment in Nashville, Tennessee, recovering from reconstructive spine surgery. Short-term disability had forced her to cut out all the luxuries, so she canceled her cable TV. When she scanned for over-the-air channels, two stations appeared, ION and one she'd never heard of called 3ABN. Then a few weeks later, the ION channel faded away. She kept her TV on night and day, mostly to break the silence. But one day, something caught her ear. A woman said, get all the goodies. And the way she said it was so curious that Larnetta rushed into the room. And there was Paula Aikens on 3ABN's Abundant Living Cooking Program. And she had braids. Larnetta thought, wow, somebody who looks like me is doing a cooking show. Do you know what else caught her attention on 3ABN? It was the Sabbath. When Larnetta learned how the day of worship had been changed from Saturday to Sunday, she was puzzled. Why would people keep all the other commandments and ignore the one that starts with the word, remember? Larnetta looked online and found references from her own denomination that the seventh day was the Sabbath. 
but when she asked her pastor about it, all he said was, we're saved by grace. Nothing she could find in the Bible indicated that Jesus had done away with the Ten Commandments on the cross. So what did Larnetta do? We'll find out next time on 3ABN Mission Moment. God bless you. Hello, friends. Welcome back. We are on Tuesday's lesson with Professor Perrin. Thank you very much, Pastor James. And I really love this story that we're going to get into today on Tuesday, which is called The Healing of the Blind Man, Part 1. So good you couldn't fit it into one day. We got two days on it. And we're looking at John chapter 9, moving from John 6 over to John 9. Once again, one of the signs of Jesus' divinity, where Jesus heals a man who was born blind. And before we get into what happens, just ponder for a moment the, the human element of this story, of what it means to be born blind, mm -hmm. starting first from the parent's perspective of infancy where you have a child and a mother never sees her son look her in the eyes. And how meaningful that would be. And a father who recognizes my son is not going to go out to work with me, at least not the way other kids will with their dad. But then beyond that, here's the weight of judgment upon mom and dad that they felt all through the growing up years. And you hear it expressed by the disciples in the first two verses of John chapter 9. Uh, because the disciples say what everybody else has been thinking all along. And the question that was addressed uh, in part in last week's lesson is explicit right here. Let's read John 9, 1 and 2. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, they present two options here. Option number one is that there's an inherited consequence. And we can see this because we, we see this happening in the real world. Things that parents do, the consequences are sometimes felt by the kids. Even what a mother or father does during pregnancy can be passed along to the children. But option, option number two is a very bizarre worldview, prenatal sin. Here's a man who, uh, before he was born, did not even have conscious thought or language, and yet somehow maybe he kicked a little too hard in the womb, or maybe he coveted another baby's growing chamber. <laughs> what, what's going on here? And, and where does this bizarre worldview lead to? Gestational confessions or, or pre-birth counseling services? We, we look at that and we say, are you, are you kidding me? Are you serious? Well, Satan is the author of bizarre worldviews. Yes, he is. And he has some tailor-made for us. And you're familiar with them, like this one. If you click on a little button below somebody's picture, you're friends! Look at that. Or, or if you watch enough 30 second videos or 10 second videos, you'll get a full education. Well, Trust me, there are people from 2,000 years ago who would look at us and say, are you kidding me? Mm. You, you really going to fall for that? Because Satan inserts his destructive thinking everywhere he can so he can ruin anything God made. Mm. And he does this even in the church, even among disciples, that we have wrong ideas that are carried forward from uh, human reasoning or misunderstanding from our past or maybe we've been listening to wrong voices and influences of people who, who really are not speaking the full truth from God. Or, or maybe we have uh, associations with people and, and instead of following God's word uh, closely, we're following those associations. And so people did it back then and we're still doing it today. But you've got to hear Jesus' response in verse 3. Jesus answered, he said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Mm. We can struggle and we can suffer in this life by no fault of our own. Amen. And you can look around at your life and the lives of others and you can see that there are those who they do have inherited traits that come down from generations. Mm. Or perhaps there's an accident or injury that they had no part in causing that. And so we can injure ourselves, and we certainly do, and there, there are painful consequences from our own actions, and we should prayerfully ask God to lead us to a cause if there is a cause that we can dealt with, deal with. 
But Jesus reveals here that not every trouble is directly traceable to our own actions. That's right. We do not need to feel judged by God simply because we are suffering. And, and as a corollary of that, we need to be careful not to judge others. Say, wow, something must be really going wrong in their life. Yeah. Instead, even if somebody's troubles in life are caused by their own decisions, we're called like Jesus to be compassionate. They still need help. And so Jesus completely bypass, bypasses the blame question here. In verse four and five, he says, all right, here, here's the answer. He says, I must work mm. the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. And here's that I am statement again. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Mm. And so Jesus focuses the attention back on the works of God that need to be exalted. And by doing so, he instructs us to also, instead of trying to figure out who's to blame, whose problem, who's going to pay, to focus on the character of God and exalting what God is like. And so then Jesus begins to demonstrate what he came here to do. So what was his mission? And I, I love how Jesus says it in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, quoting Isaiah 61. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and in the context of this story, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. No talk of blame here, simply a statement, I've come to do the work of restoring. Yeah. And if you go to Isaiah 58, you're gonna see the same mission given to us, a mission of restoration of the needy. But we got to then see what Jesus does. Now, I, I don't know how curious you would have been, but I would have been incredibly curious as verse six and seven then describes Jesus spitting on the ground, mm. making some clay, putting it on this man's eyes and saying, go and wash. The Bible calls this the opening of the eyes of the blind, but there's so much more involved than simply opening eyes. This man was born with a non-functioning visual system. Somewhere during prenatal development, the, optional, the optical function stopped developing. And so no visual stimulus was ever received in the brain. No input went into the visual cortex of the occipital lobe. It's kind of like if you look at a lawn where people walk a lot, a pathway gets developed. Right. If nobody walks there, no path develops. So with no input being received in that part of the brain, those neural pathways in the visual center of the mind never developed. They were simply not there. Mm -hmm. This is not like Jesus fixing something that was broken. He creates something that never existed mm. and he does it with clay, just look at, reminding us of Genesis chapter two, where God creates out of nothing. And here Jesus, now we, we can look at this, knowing the functions of the mind, uh, Jesus creates out of nothing. And so now I wanna highlight just a couple of statements that I love from Romans chapter four, uh, verse 17 to 22. I'm just gonna take little pieces where it says, God gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. That's right. God bringing something out of nothing. A little later in the chat, in, in just a couple of verses later, contrary to hope, this is Abraham, contrary to hope, in hope believed. In other words, when all hope was gone, there was no chance at hope. There was no hope left. He was beyond hope, past hope, hopeless. Yet he still believed in the power of God. He did not consider his own body, thinking of Abraham, did not consider his own body already dead or the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promises of God, being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able to perform and it was counted to him as righteousness. So there's encouragement to us in this story of Jesus who takes something that did not exist and creates it right there before the eyes of all the others. And it reminds us that there is confidence for us, that there are promises for us in trusting his word. This man trusted in the word of God and we're called to do the same thing. Take the word of God, yeah. take him at his word, Amen. take these things that Jesus said. And here's one in John 16, 33. And we can take this, take him at his word. He said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, mm. you will have tribulation. Mm. 
but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We can look out at a world where it doesn't look like the forces of good have overcome, but we can say God is still creating his new creation in me. He's putting together in his church, the body of Christ, a restored body of Christ, and we can take him at his word. This then gives this man the opportunity to tell a testimony. And that's what the rest of the, the chapter is all about. What does this man have to say about the restoring, restructuring, recreating power of God. When you take God at His word, He'll give you the same testimony to share with others. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful. So we are now on Wednesday's portion of the lesson. Um, my name is John Dinsey. The title for this part is The Healing of the Blind Man, Part 2. This takes us into John chapter 9, verses 17 to 34. And the lesson brings the following. What questions did the leaders ask and how did the blind man respond? Now, it is interesting. This is one of those uh, parts of the gospel of John where you get a behind the scenes look because normally it focuses on Jesus. He goes here, he goes there, things happen, he moves on. But this one takes you a little bit into the background as to what happened to the person that received the healing. Uh, let's begin in John 9, 17. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. Mm -hmm. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, asked them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? <laughs> so this is a notable miracle. People knew this man for many years. He is now a man, he's not a child. And they knew he was blind. The whole community knew he was blind. Mm. So they cannot ignore this miracle. So now let's go to verse 20. His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. Now his parents said this, these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him. This idea of being put out of the synagogue means they could not come into fellowship with the other believers in the synagogue. They were excluded and they did not want this to happen to them. But so they said, he's of age, ask him. Uh, so what is going on here? Why did the leading Jews take this position against Jesus Christ? Why, I, why aren't they happy? This is the Messiah. Uh, well, we know now that uh, it is because they expected a different Messiah. And when you look at this, they expected a political military leader that was going to deliver them from the Romans and uh, the oppression and restore Israel to sovereignty. Uh, of course, they also expected uh, the re temple to be rebuilt. It had been destroyed by the Babylonians and somewhat rebuilt, but it still needed some improvement. And they expected the Messiah to do that. And Jesus was not doing any of this. Oh, they expected the Messiah to bring, gather the exiles from all over the world. And Jesus was not doing that. And they expected uh, the Messiah to deliver them from the Romans and establish peace throughout the earth. And Jesus was not doing that. <laughs> and so, of course, there's some degree of jealousy here and selfishness that is among the leaders. And they are not receiving all the attention they used to get before because now everybody wants to know, where's Jesus? We want to hear him. Mm -hmm. And so this is a little background. Now let's go back a little bit into John chapter five. Just read a couple of verses here. It says in John 5, 18, therefore the Jews sought, to, sought the more to kill him because he not only had broken the Sabbath according to them, but said also that God was his father making himself equal with God. Uh, let's look at John 7, 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee for he would not walk in Jewelry uh, because the Jews sought to kill him. Mm. So it was beginning to spread. 
that the leaders of the Jews wanted to kill Jesus and word was getting around. Already we read that uh, if anyone confessed about Jesus, he was going to be put out of the synagogue. Word was spreading mm -hmm. about Jesus. And uh, let's look at uh, uh, John chapter 7, verse 25 and 26. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, is not this he whom they seek to kill? So word was getting around, people knew. But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? People are wondering, is this the Christ? Is this the Messiah? Now we have to skip some of these things. Let's go to John chapter 7, verse 45 uh, through 48. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never a man spake yeah. like this man. Then answered them, the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Now, this is very, very interesting because these people that have said, uh, never a man spoke like this man. Something happened to them as they heard Jesus speak. And they said, wait a minute, maybe we're, maybe we're wrong about this guy. Look at the way he speaks. There's nobody that has spoken like this man. And isn't it something the way that sometimes when somebody receives conviction after reading something or being taught something that is truth, that somebody comes along and says, are you also deceived? Do you not know that it's not the way you think, it's this way? And conviction, they try to bring it down or uh, diminish what people were impressed with. Now, John chapter 8 verses um, we're going to have to go to verses 56 to 59 because it really sets the background for what is happening in John chapter 9. Uh, it says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Then said, Je Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. Oh, this was something they could not bear to hear. And so it says in verse 59, Then took they of stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Mm -hmm. So what does this tell you? They were looking for Jesus. Mm -hmm. They wanted to stone him and they were not able to at this particular point. So when we're over here in John chapter 9, uh, let's go now to verse 24. So they again called the, the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. They're admitting this is a miracle. It's a miracle from God, but you give God the glory. And uh, he answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Oh, now this blind man is bringing some awareness to them. Uh, that Jesus did a miracle. He is from God. Do you want to be his disciples? Verse 28, then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We're better. This man, we don't know who he is. He's a sinner. Uh, now, verse 29, we know that God spoke to Moses as for this fellow. Now, this is interesting because that part is in it italicized. Uh, it is really the word there uh, as... Uh, we know that God spoke to Moses, this, like this guy, this person that is really nothing, mm. we do not know where he is from. Mm. Basically, they're saying he's not from God. We don't know where he's from, but he's not from God. Verse 30, the man answered and said to them, why this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his, his will, he, he hears him. That's good news for you and me. Mm. If you're a worshiper of God and you follow the Lord, God hears you. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Now, verse 32, since the world began, 
it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. He's telling them, realize what has happened here. Mm -hmm. This is a miracle from God and Jesus the Messiah did this miracle. Now, it says in verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. So we see here that this man was <laughs> witnessing, the Holy Spirit was with him mm -hmm. and was witnessing to them to realize this is the Messiah. This is he who we are waiting for. Uh, and he, if he was not from God, he could do nothing. If he was not the Messiah, he could do nothing. And of course they could not stand this and they cast him out. Time is up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny. Each one of you, Daniel and Shelley and Pastor James, what a great study. Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm just thinking if the Jewish leaders, you see their antagonism against Jesus grow, you see the hatred against Jesus grow. By the time you come to Thursday's lesson and the resurrection of Lazarus, their hatred of Jesus has just reached epic proportions. We're looking at the resurrection of Lazarus. My name's Jill Morricone. On Thursday, this is the seventh sign in John's gospel. We've talked about the signs. This is sign number seven, the final sign there, the resurrection of Lazarus. I love what Shelley talked about with the seven I am statements of Jesus. We talked about Jesus is the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He demonstrates that how? By feeding bread to the 5,000. Mm -hmm. We talked about Jesus is the light of the world. How does he demonstrate that? By giving sight mm -hmm. to the man who was born blind. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We're going to read that in our verses today. How does he demonstrate that? By raising Lazarus from the dead. We have nine takeaways, if we get to them all, from the resurrection of Lazarus. And they're all centered on takeaways of love. I want to start with a question. How can there be love when there's death? How can love allow a trial? How can love not answer your prayer? How can love still trust and believe even when you're in pain? How can love change us? And how can love set us free? This is what we encounter with the resurrection of Lazarus. We're in John 11. Turn with me to John chapter 11. We pick up the story in verse 1. John 11, verse 1. A certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Verse 3, therefore the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is sick. Takeaway number one, love asks with confidence and assurance. Martha and Mary, they were confident in their relationship with Jesus. They're not afraid to ask. They're not afraid to tell him of their needs, confident that he's going to listen to them and he's going to help. Verse 4, when Jesus heard that, that Lazarus is sick, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Takeaway number two, love keeps the bigger picture in mind. What you and I see is devastating, sickness. We don't want to be sick. We don't want those that we love to be sick. It might be part of God's bigger plan. Can sickness even be for the glory of God? Mm -hmm. Can a betrayal of a friend even be for the glory of God? Mm -hmm. Can a job loss even be for the glory of God? And can death itself be for the glory of God. You see, love demands an eternal perspective. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Wait a minute. I thought he loved him. I thought he loved Lazarus and Martha and Mary. And yet, he chose to stay for two more days. Wouldn't you think if he loved them, he'd rush to them? If someone you knew was sick, would you not be in the hospital with them? Would you not go to them? Takeaway three, love is not always easy to understand right now. Love actually kept Jesus from going to heal Lazarus. 
think about that a while. Go to verse 7. After this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. But the disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you. Are you really going there again? Take away four. Love is not afraid to take risks. It would be risky for Jesus to go back to Jerusalem. It would prove risky for Jesus to raise Lazarus from the dead. But when it is the will of God, love will take the risk. Love will do anything. Jump down to verse 17. When Jesus came, he found that he, that's Lazarus, had already been in the tomb four days. Mm -hmm. Jump down to verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, he will give it to you. Takeaway number five, love still trusts and believes even in pain. So in her pain, in her time of deep devastation, what is she saying? God, if you'd only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But even yet, I still have faith. Even yet, I still believe. Even yet, I still trust. This is the mother who's crushed by sorrow, who says, my son died, but I will still trust you. This is the parent whose children no longer speak to them. Say, I will still trust you. This is the person who's dealing with extreme loss, who says, I will still trust trust you. Verse 23, Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Martha says, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. Amen. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet he will live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? That's the key, the crux of the whole matter. Do you believe this? She said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into this world. Take away number six. Love asks for radical faith and commitment. It was a radical faith to believe that Jesus could raise her brother from the dead. Did Martha believe Jesus or not? Did she believe his word? Would she believe his promise? She chose by faith to cling to him and to believe and trust regardless of the circumstances. Verse 41, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Takeaway number seven. Love expresses faith even before the miracle occurs. You see, Jesus thanked God. Thank you that you've heard me. And Lazarus, he's not alive. He's still dead. Mm -hmm. And yet Jesus says, thank you that you have heard me. Mm -hmm. You see, if you and I wait until we receive it, that's not faith. That's gratitude. Thank you for what you've done and given to me. But faith reaches out and says, I believe and thank you for what you've done, even when you have not yet received it. That's what Jesus did. Verse 43. Now, when he had said these things, he, Jesus, cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Takeaway number eight, love's word, that's the word of Jesus, contains creative power and energy. You know, it says in Psalms, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He spoke and it was done. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is power when God speaks. There is power in the word of God. And when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, Lazarus came forth. Our last takeaway, verse 44, we're in the middle of the verse. He comes out bound hand and foot. Jesus says, loose him and let him go. Takeaway number nine. Love, it always sets us free. Loose him and let him go. Mm -hmm. Are you bound in addiction and sin? Jesus speaking to you right now. Loose him and let him go. Are you bound in past mistakes and regrets? Jesus says to you, loose him and let him go. 
Are you bound in fear and uncertainty? Jesus says, loose him and let him go. Are you bound in arrogance and pride? Jesus says, loose him and let him go. Are you bound in sorrow and depression? Jesus says, loose him and let him go. Are you bound in selfishness? Jesus says, loose him and let him go. You see, love, it always sets us free. John 8, verse 36. Whoever, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Those are the takeaways that I see from the resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus came to set you and I free. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jill. It was a blessing. And thank you, John and Daniel and Shelley. We've got a few minutes left uh, just to share some closing thoughts. We'll start with you, Shelley. Jesus is the great I am. He presented himself to the people as the great I am, the Yahweh Bible of the Old Testament, the God who it was, is, and is to come. But they were looking for some kind of personal benefit, some kind of material benefit instead of eternal truth. And they missed him. And you know what? We got to be careful that we don't just seek him for material benefits. Look to Jesus for eternal truth. Amen. 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 Jesus creates out of nothing when there's nothing there. And this story in John 9 is more than just about physical eyesight. Inside of us, there is no righteousness. And so Christ promises, I can give you the righteousness of Christ, his own righteousness Mm -hmm. that we could not create on our own. Amen. Amen. It could be that the Lord has done a miracle in your life or in the life of someone near you and you have heard about it. And the thing that we want to leave with you about this is, Believe in Jesus. Do not doubt. Believe in Him. Amen. Amen. There's power in the Word of God. And the same Word that spoke in the beginning and said, let there be light, and there was light. That same Word has power to recreate in you and I the image of Jesus, to change our natures from that old nature of sin to the new nature of Jesus. Amen. 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 Great lesson. We've gotten a great start here with the signs of divinity. Now, next week, we're actually going to go back to the beginning of the book. Yes, in the third lesson, we're going back to the beginning. And we're going to establish the backstory, the prologue. We're going to be introducing this story now that we've emphasized that Christ is divine. It's really important for us to recognize what the book of John, the Gospel of John is doing here. Establishing the divinity of Christ as no other gospel does, emphasizing this because of the need we have for divine power in our lives. And as we've been talking here, we've recognized that only divinity, only Christ in the person of this man that was incarnate for us, God incarnate in Christ, only Christ can deliver us from the bondage of sin. Mm -hmm. So we really want to encourage you to join us as we continue this journey in the Gospel of John. It's going to be a great uh, journey for us, great lessons for us to come. We're looking forward to uh, opening up this prologue, opening up this uh, foundation, uh, the backstory in John chapter one. So be sure and join us next week for our lesson, which is entitled The Backstory, The Prologue. Until then, God bless. Thank you.